So good, good morning. Welcome back after your coffee break um, and welcome to session two. Uh, my name is Brian Kinirons. I'm president of the College of Anesthesiologists of Ireland. And in session two, we're celebrating partnerships, partnerships for education and training in a changing world. Uh, unlike the first session, uh, each of our speakers will speak for 10 minutes. Um, at the end of the uh, presentations, there will be a question and answer session. And I would encourage you to um, use the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen um, if you want to ask the panel any questions. So as I said, today is about partnerships, celebrating partnerships. And this is really about celebra celebrating in many ways the voice of our partners. And we will hear the voices from our partners from Zimbabwe, uh, from Tanzania, from Ethiopia, uh, Zambia, and even far, from far-flung Gori. So it, um, it gives me great pleasure to, to celebrate the first partnership, uh, and I'm going to invite to the webinar stage uh, Dr. Doreen Mashaba. This is celebrating the partnership uh, that is Canexa, which is the College of Anesthesiologists of East Central and Southern Africa. And this is a partnership with multiple stakeholders, uh, not uh, the least including our own college, um, RCSI, uh, Irish Aid, and indeed our sister college in London at the Royal College of Anesthetists. Um, Dr. Mashava is uh, from Zimbabwe. She's an anesthesiologist and intensivist, and uh, she's a founding fellow of Canexa and is currently serving uh, since 2014 as a registrar for Conexa. So I'm very uh, happy to welcome uh, Doreen to the webinar stage. Doreen, you're very welcome. Thank you, Brian. Can I have the first slide? A good morning to you all. My name is uh, Dr. Doreen Mashala, the academic registrar for Conexa. Next slide. I wish to thank the organizers for inviting me to make this presentation on Kanexa, the journey so far in the way forward. Next. So Kanexa is the College of Anesthesiologists for East Central in Southern Africa, which was founded in 2011. The aim being advancing education standards in research in safe anesthesia in critical care for the people of East, Central and Southern Africa. The constituent member countries are Eswatini, Kenya, Malawi, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and possibly Namibia. Next slide. Kanexa was launched at Mount Meru Hotel in Arusha, Tanzania in February 2014. Next slide. And the college is, um, it's a constituent member of the College of Health Sciences in East Central and Southern Africa, among other colleges. Next. So the progress so far since the COVID pandemic administration, the college has recruited an administrative officer who is based in EXA headquarters in Arusha. And the training curriculum has been set up, it has been developed, and now in its initial implementation. The accreditation process has started the second half of uh, 2020 and recruitment of uh, trainees will start the 1st of February, 2021. Registration, the college has recruited 24 fellowship candidates and 11 membership candidates coming from Canexa region for the inaugural Canexa examination. In recognition of the uh, membership, is located in all member countries except for Tanzania. Next. This is the EXA head office in Arusha. 
Next. So examinations has been a big stride for Canexa since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And a mock examination has been conducted to test the candidates' knowledge based on recent trial with the DECAMED's uh, weekly curriculum. Uh, written examinations have occurred at both the fellowship and membership uh, levels. And this was set uh, and written on the 7th of October, 2020. And this was online. The College of Anesthetists for Ireland is assisted with the examination committee uh, in as far as the question bank is concerned. And the clinical examinations have been rescheduled to the first quarter of um, 2021 uh, because of the COVID uh, pandemic. Next. So this is the first examination, the mock examination, which was uh, conducted, run by DECAMED, uh, and 51 of the candidates participated. This was on the 7th of August, 2020. It was a three hour online examination. Next. And uh, another examination, a mock examination was conducted uh, on the 23rd of September. Uh, again online with the Zoom proctoring. This was monitored uh, via Zoom. And uh, the College of Anesthetists for Ireland provided the question bank, um, which assisted in setting these examinations. And the 34 candidates took part. Next. So the inaugural examination for Canexa took place um, on the 7th of October. Next. It was an online examination proctored via Zoom and uh, monitored through the administrative offices in, uh, in Arusha. And uh, every member country had uh, a, a computer set and there was central monitoring in Arusha. Next, 35 candidates took place. I mean, 35 candidates uh, participated in this examination. So this is the uh, examination in progress with invigilators on site. Next. Bes besides the examination for the candidates, Canexa has also had uh, uh, training for the examiners, which took place on the 4th of September. And this was facilitated by College of Anesthesiologists for Ireland. It was a virtual uh, course, and, uh, which accommodated um, uh, quite a number of, of delegates, 106 delegates were trained. And these were from all the eight member countries. Next. Uh, next. Next slide. So e-learning uh, platform. Canexa has an e-learning platform um, with materials for the candidates. Uh, it's learn.canexa.com and the platform is under trial and it will soon be, be released to the candidates for basic training and advanced training, research and reference, as well as a resource uh, for trainers. Next. Communication and visibility of the college. Communication has mainly been virtual through uh, WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp platforms. Uh, even the meetings have been through WhatsApp platforms in Zoom. Um, the college is a website which was designed by Canexa and uh, is being maintained uh, by the Royal College of St. John's through Eric and our administrative officer, Sophia. Can, the college also has a, a Facebook page as well as a Twitter page. Next slide. So research and funding. 
Situation analysis of the anesthesiologist workforce in East Central and South Africa is underway. The aim being to bridge the gap in the workforce for provision of safe anesthesia to the people of EXA countries. Smile Train has assisted uh, in sponsoring fellows to produce, to provide for tuition, travel costs and uh, subsistence allowance as well as administrative costs. USAID through UCSF in discussion with the University College of California uh, are in collaboration with the WFSA and they've got some funding from USAID and they're interested to work with Canexa to provide some materials for different modules such as respiratory system modules, as well as um, relevant equipment modules for the Canexa curriculum. And Irish aid through the Royal College of Surgeons for Ireland in Cosexa have um, given a funding of 1,000 uh, euros for a one-year period. Uh, the college is awaiting their response on our application for more. And the European Best Alliance um, uh, deliberations are still in progress. Next slide. Next slide. Strategic engagement and partnership. The college is working in close collaboration with health ministries in the region international organizations like WFSA, uh, College of Anesthetists for Ireland, the Royal College of Surgeons for Ireland for technical and financial support. And the uh, Canexa strategic plan for 2021 to 2025 uh, has been drafted. Uh, let me take this opportunity to the partnership that the college has with uh, the College of Surgeons for East Central in Southern Africa, the Royal College of Surgeons for Ireland, the Royal College of Anesthetists, the College of Anesthetists for Ireland, and the Irish government through uh, Irish aid, and not forgetting Smile Train and Decament. Next slide. I wish to thank you for your attention. Um, th thank you very much, um, Dorian, on behalf of uh, Conexa. And again, if um, any of our delegates are, are, are registrants have any questions for uh, Conexa and Dorian specifically, please use the question and answer session. So I'm now going to uh, welcome uh, to the stage um, Ms. Stella Itungu. Um, this is a celebrating partnership between um, COSEXA, which is the College of Surgeons of East, Southern and Central Africa, and RCSI, and of course, Irish Aid, who've been fundamental uh, in, in that particular piece. Ms. Tungu has a Master of Science in Finance and Investment. She has a bachelor's degree in Public Administration and also a diploma in International Trade and Policy Development. She is currently serves as the COO of COSEXA. And um, you're very, very welcome, Stella, to the stage. Oh, thank you, Brad. Can you hear me, Brian? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead, Stella. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Brian, and uh, thanks to everyone, the previous speakers. I'd like to thank the Forum for Irish Postgraduate Medical Training Body, training bodies, including the RCSI, um, Royal College of Surgeons um, Ireland, for organizing this very important event. I wish to also thank the leadership of uh, Professor O'Connell, and with his uh, resourceful persons, especially uh, Eric Offley, uh, Mark Schrein, uh, Deirdre Mangoang, for all the support that they are providing COSEXA, not leaving behind the Irish government for supporting COSEXA from its nascent stage to where we are today. My name is Stella Itungu, the Chief Operating Officer of the College of Surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa. Next slide. Um, uh, I'm going to cover uh, what you're seeing on the screen. Those are the areas that I'm going to talk about. Uh, next slide. Uh, COSEXA is a college without walls. Why a college without walls? We train our trainees within 
the hospitals where they work and we use the existing infrastructure. This has proved very beneficial in a way that uh, it's practical. We use the existing resources of the hospitals and it has proved to have raised our retention levels of the surgeons that we train to 90% across the region, across the extra region. Uh, COSEXA aims to uh, promote excellence in surgical care, in training, research, in order to provide the surgical services to the least attended to patients or the neglected patients. Next slide. Um, in line with the uh, La Santa Commission uh, report of 2015, we will see that uh, the World Health Organization also has got a report on on its strategy of human resources for health, uh, Workforce 2030. They talk of accessibility, affordability, acceptability, uh, availability, and quality. In that regard, uh, next slide. COSEXA advances education and training to bridge the gap of the shortage of the health workforce, especially in the surgical sector across the region and beyond. And COSEXA's training model is a five-year program, uh, which includes a two-year MCS program, which is a basic uh, surgery training program, a foundation program, I must say. And then a three to four-year specialty program, which is the FCS, depending on what specialty you select out of these ones. Next slide. COSEXA has 14 member countries uh, in the East, Central, and Southern Africa. In addition to the 14 member countries, it has six satellite countries. By satellite countries, these are countries that are not member states or member countries of COSEXA, but we have training sites. And in those uh, countries, we have 125 accredited hospitals. These hospitals are accredited by the team of experts from across the region within the COSEXA structures the registrar, we have the county representatives, the program directors that help in the accreditation process and the accreditation process is by the international standards that are set with the help of um, RCSI uh, collaboration program. Uh, next. Uh, we all know that there's no training, especially professional training that can be done without uh, examination. COSEXA has two uh, examinations, one part one is the MCS, MCQX questions, and then part two that uh, involves OSCEs, that is uh, um, structured also, and VIVAs. With these examinations, we have external examiners and these are international examiners. We also have the patient-less examination and the international examiners. They help us in setting and reviewing the criteria and the standards of the examinations to the best practice, international practice. And uh, as of September, we moved from physical examination to online examination. These were successfully conducted. And I must say we did not have any glitches. At least 98% uh, was covered without any issues. Uh, next slide. Now, talking about COSEXA and talking about uh, the role of global partnerships, especially in line with the low and middle income countries with partnership with high and middle income countries. You will see from this slide, it's a summary of COSEXA's journey from its nascent stage to where we are today. I must say that um, uh, RCSI COSEXA collaboration supported by the Irish government has been so tremendous in having COSEXA reach this stage, especially in being part of the health workforce of global surgery at the international arena. You will see by the numbers that at uh, the beginning, uh, we had only two collaboration partners, but these were at a low scale. There were no administrative structures, uh, structures at that time. And um, the, the one, there was no capacity to undertake the programs until RCSI came on board in 2007 to 2008. We, they developed two programs which were online, basic online e-learning, case studies, short courses, the School for Surgeons platform. 
and this development gave birth to the support of Irish aid. Uh, once again, Irish aid, the Irish government, you've been so resourceful, and we thank you for believing in an African institution. And with the support of Irish aid, we had um, streamlined administration, information management, visibility of Forsexa on the international arena, uh, the quality assurance, especially in training and examinations as the program caters. It's an all round program that looks at systems, looks at infrastructure, the management, the coordination, the visibility, the quality and training and technological advancement. Next slide. What are the achievements after this partnership? We all, we are all looking at what benefits um, what benefits come out of a collaboration? We must say that COSEX is a success story. It registered a lot of uh, uh, achievements, as you can see. The list is enormous. Maybe I've even left out some of them, but um, I will point out uh, very important ones, especially the internationally developed curriculum, online examination, recognition of qualifications in the region, uh, internationally recognized qualification, retention of trainees, administrative structures. The number of member countries increased because the collaboration put us on an international arena where COSEXA became known. And I must say that it's now a household name for surgical training in the region, both nationally, regionally, and internationally. Uh, next slide. Uh, in addition to, to uh, the Irish aid support that we have, and in, in terms of aligning ourselves to international policy, as well as uh, international best practice, COSEXA has managed to collaborate with some other partners, and these uh, support COSEXA uh, in terms of scholarships, in terms of examiners, curriculum reviews, and trainings. I must say, that the collaboration partnership is majorly entirely covered by the, by the Irish uh, aid, and then the rest coming in terms of scholarships, examiners, curriculum reviews, and trainings. And this, this is a list of all the partners that we have, and we thank them for their support as well. Next slide. Uh, with the support of all these collaboration partners, COSEX has been able to penetrate in both urban and rural, and uh, if you, we have 125 uh, hospitals that are accredited and where our training program, programs are conducted, but 38, 40% of those are based in rural areas. And thanks to the collaboration partners for their support that we are able to penetrate the hardest areas that some may not reach. But for sex has tried to balance with the support uh, of the collaboration partners by reaching the far areas in terms of surgical care delivery. Next slide. Uh, you will see the trend uh, this reflects the support of um, uh, the collaboration partners, especially Irish aid, as I say, uh, from 2002 to 2007, you will see from the figures, we had only two collaboration partners and those were at a low scale. Then Irish aid, uh, RCSI comes in from 2008 and then Irish aid, you will see the numbers have more than doubled every, every year. We have figures that are doubling for program entry. And these are trainees that we have entering the COSEXA program. To date, we have 208 88 trainees that enroll for COSEXA programs. And that's how the collaboration partnership has helped us move from 2 to 5, 14, now we are in 200 for each year of entry. Next slide. Um, this, we will look at only these, uh, 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 these are specialties and the number of trainees in each specialty. You look at general surgery with the highest mark, highest uh, number, with, which has 137. Orthopedic surgery is 111. Uh, uh, reasons attributing to that is because these two specialties are the oldest specialties on the COSEXA program. However, the rest are, are catching up uh, slowly but slowly, but we'll get there. And you will see, as uh, Dr. Mike Ryan said, that there's a, uh, a divide of female and male in terms of the health workforce. You can see that men are 601 and female are 140. 
So we still need to work on uh, the women or gender balance in terms of the health workforce in the region. Next. Uh, graduate skill, um, I want to report that uh, Cosexa has to date graduated 448 surgeons since its inception. And these numbers started rising with the systems in place, the visibility, the online platform, the infrastructure, the case studies and the training, train the trainers and several other activities that were in the collaboration program that were enhancing the, the training module of COSEXA. Uh, next. Stella, it's a minute 11 now. You'll have to wrap up fairly soon, please. Yeah, yeah. The impact of uh, COVID. COVID has impacted uh, heavily on most of the activities uh, in the region and uh, globally, but save for the strong and resilient systems that we were doing our activities mostly online, uh, we had uh, uh, all the, most of the activities of COSEXA were implemented and uh, we've had to move and this was not a very pivotal move because we're already online. We've had our online meetings, online trainings, online examinations, and these are saved costs. However, due to the blended approach that everyone is talking about, we still need the physical workshop where people need to travel with time. We cannot entirely rely on online activities next. I'll not talk much about this, but these are recommendations that are required. I'll just uh, mention that defining and creating equitable and sustainable collaborations that focus on the priorities of the low middle income country and the trainees in line with the objectives of the collaboration partners will enhance the collaboration of both the training and the health workforce. And um, these are the areas where I pointed to their CPD programs, mentorships, skills labs, capacity building programs, technological advancements, and so on and so forth. Next, next please. Um, this is a milestone that I would want to talk about. And uh, sorry, Brian, but give me some few minutes. Even during COVID, when most activities were on hold, I want to say that COSEXA registered 250,000 operations during COVID. And this is in line with the Irish Aid Overseas Policy, a better world, better quality, um, surgical care for more patients because more patients were treated, many trainees participated, several cases were handled, and this is where we are with COSEXA accessibility, affordability, availability, and quality. Next slide. Finally, I want to say that it's been said that surgery is the neglected stepchild of the global health, but I want to say that COSEXA RCSI collaboration is the adopted child of the Irish government. We still need your support. We are your adopted child. We are still on the move. You, you saw us on baby steps. We are now beginning to walk. We shall run as we get to the collaboration and moving forward with the strategic plans that we have. I thank you all and thank all the collaboration partners that are on this forum. Thank you for organizing this important symposium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Stella, um, for um, representing uh, COSEXA and uh, telling us uh, uh, the, the COSEXA story to date. Uh, I'm now going to invite to the stage our next speaker uh, on this event. This is Dr. Joe Gallagher. Um, uh, Dr. Gallagher is a GP in Gori. Um, he is cardiovascular lead in the Irish College of General Practitioners. However, he is with us today to uh, as a, his role as founder of the Gori Malawi Partnership, which has been previously referenced by our COO, uh, Dr. Colin Henry. And uh, today we're celebrating the, that uh, relationship between um, his practice in Gori and St. John's Hospital in Mizuzu in Malawi. Joe, you're very welcome. Thanks very much, Brian. Can you take the next slide, please. So uh, this morning, I want to talk about a much smaller partnership than those we've heard about already and how our work changed during COVID-19 and also give a brief introduction to the work of Global Health and the Irish College of General Practitioners. Next slide, please. So the Gori Malawi Health Partnership links St. John's Hospital Mazuzu in northern Malawi with the uh, very exotically named PAMS GP surgery in Gori County, Wexford, and our focus has been on non-communicable diseases. So next slide, please. 
This is a pandemic of another sort, which again affects every country around the world and is a major cause of premature morbidity and mortality, particularly in low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. Our work prior to COVID-19 focused very much on community education. We would have GP trainees who would travel with us to learn about the management of uh, chronic diseases in Africa. We'd have run workshops with our colleagues, particularly focusing on non-physician health workers in Malawi and remote mentoring using Zoom, which again involved undergraduate and postgraduate trainees. Next slide, please. But as the clouds of COVID-19 gathered over Ireland and concern rose in Africa, we obviously need to take a change in direction. And uh, through a series of online meetings and using email and WhatsApp, it became apparent that one of the greatest needs that was felt by our colleagues in Malawi was education for healthcare workers and healthcare managers. Uh, and this was because there was a lot of information coming at that time, the same as what it was in Ireland. The situation was changing rapidly, a lot of large documents, but it's very difficult to appraise the evidence. And it's felt that often, even when we looked at that evidence, it was not applicable in Malawi because of the resources available. So next slide, please, Brian. So using, again, online methods, we took a rapid review of current international guidelines and we identified the key topics that they covered. Our colleagues in Malawi reviewed those and decided which ones they felt were most relevant to them. And then the discussion was how, well, how once we've created these educational resources, how do we disseminate them? And the decision was made to develop short animated videos that could be disseminated by WhatsApp and social media so they could reach further into remote and rural areas and also be disseminated quickly. Next slide, please. Of course, it's not something we could have done alone, and we were really grateful to have the expertise and enthusiasm of a number of, of players, particularly the Global Health Programme and the Irish Health Service Executive, the Global Health Group and the Irish College of General Practitioners, the Irish Global Health Network and Esther Ireland all came together to help us in both creating content, developing the animations and disseminating them. Next slide, please. And the result was 14 videos on a variety of topics, such as getting your institution ready, maintaining essential health services, protecting health workers, clinical care of those with COVID-19 and those with comorbidities, and for a more general audience, things such as myths and facts about COVID-19. And these are all available on the Esther website and also on Facebook. So next slide, please. So we were delighted to see initially this little take of around a thousand views uh, of these videos. There's only around 250 health workers in St. Uh, John's Hospital, Mizuzu. So we thought this was fantastic. But then we discovered the power of social media and how you can target videos to both certain groups, such as healthcare workers, and to certain geographical areas. I'll just click again, Brian. And the result was a, a viral spread, spread, to pardon the pun, of these videos all across Africa. Next slide, please. And the result has been that as of last week, the videos have been played all, over 1.8 million times in almost every country in Africa, which is far beyond the spread we ever envisaged these going. So next slide, please. Not only that, but the Malawi Ministry of Health picked these up on social media and said, well, we're doing Zoom CPD sessions to all our healthcare facilities. Can we use these to sort of uh, stimulate discussion among our, our healthcare institutions? And so they were picked up there by social media also. Next slide, please. So the videos, and as I mentioned, our original focus was on non-communicable diseases. And one of our videos is on maintaining essential health services. And this WhatsApp message from our colleague Hastings Gonway, who's a clinical officer in St. John's, highlights the significant disruption to essential health services that has happened in Malawi. Thankfully, COVID-19 hasn't overwhelmed hospitals in Malawi, but it has certainly disrupted a lot of health services, including those for chronic diseases. Next slide, please. So our focus now returns to how can we better improve the management of chronic diseases and to uh, use the WHO's phrase to build back better. Based on the success of, of the videos, we're looking at using online learning platforms like what have been used before that will allow people to view them if they're in, in, in reach of a digital signal, if not to be able to download these lessons and gives a sense of not only are people looking at these, but are they learning from them and generate discussion and will they actually be able to uh, implement these practices in their areas. We continue to use digital technologies such as WhatsApp and Zoom to discuss problem cases and create communities of practice so that different clinical officers and nurses and nurse midwife technicians in different parts of Malawi can discuss how do they adapt these resources to their particular area. Next slide, please, Brian. Just to mention the Irish College of General Practitioners, uh, they formed a global health special interest group in 2017 and currently we have 290 members of that group. 
We have regular meetings and newsletters on, on topics related to global health. And we're delighted that the college has recently supported the appointment of a global health fellow. John Morris is a GP in Galway who has significant international and national healthcare organizational experience and really drives the development of global health in the ICGP. Early on in the pandemic, the college provided a series of small rapid response grants for partners in low-income countries to enable them to prepare for the arrival of COVID-19, which although small were timed at the right time and made a significant impact for those people who were able to receive them. As I mentioned, we're already involved in the development of the COVID-19 videos. And also the GP training scheme in the Southeast has long had a accredited rotation in Malawi, which has been disrupted by COVID-19, but hopefully will return again has been a significant source of people learning about primary care in Africa as well as in Ireland. So next slide, please. Mike. So finally, this Irish proverb has been mentioned before. I think now more than ever, it's uh, true that we all live in the shadow of each other. Global health education needs to be seen as a core part of the curriculum of both undergraduate and postgraduate uh, training bodies. But harnessing the digital revolution, and I think the use of tools such as e-learning and web conferencing provides an opportunity for both trainees and trainers across the world to work together on a sustained basis, rather than even the intermittent basis we had where we used to visit each other. But that said, I hope we can embrace this and that we do get to meet again in person in the future, because that is still important. Thanks, Brian. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, um, Joe, for your synopsis and your ongoing commitment to, to the Malawi project. Um, so, uh, again, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage uh, our next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Desilim Bekele. He is a quality improvement champion, and he has a leadership role in quality improvement uh, at the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia. And, of course, this is in part celebrating the long-standing link between the HSE Global Health Programme, as led by David Wheatley and Ethiopia. So, um, Dr. Desilim, uh, you're very welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be presenting this marvelous work to this uh, uh, platform. And uh, this is the uh, partnership between the Ethiopian government and the Irish uh, side institutions, including the uh, Irish Aid, ISQA, and the HSC. And it was initiated as, uh, for the response of uh, a gap that we are having here in the data as we are working for uh, improving uh, quality of the health system uh, overall we had a problem in uh, cascading the quality improvement projects and for that uh, we decided uh, to have a new model uh, that will answer our questions that we have uh, raised during the implementation of the cascading uh, quality improvement training for that, uh, the, uh, the HSC side, uh, led by Dr. David, uh, started the communication with the, our directorate in the ministry, and we divided a method of training of the QI uh, to help uh, professionals, especially the clinicians, uh, practicing in the Addis Ababa hospitals, 12 Addis Ababa hospitals. And initially, the total of 60 participants were enrolled, and we cascaded uh, three rounds of workshops uh, in, in, in hotel based and uh, two rounds of uh, online coaching. In the, in, the, in, the, in the times of online coaching, specifically, we have introduced a very good platform that helped us in the, in the, in the initiative that I'm going to discuss later uh, to, to use that opportunity. Uh, the, the virtual platform, the remote coaching was uh, given by uh, a team uh, comprised of the uh, the the ISPA uh, Peter, uh, Peter Lachman and the uh, uh, David from HSC. So we we have uh, these teams uh, working on the after initial uh, quality improvement training. They 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 work on the quality improvement real uh, scenarios in the hospitals and they started to uh, test the change ideas and. When they face the problems and uh, when they see uh, a good gains, they will communicate and uh, they will present in the uh, subsequent, uh, they present in the subsequent uh, coaching sessions that happen in each year visit. So uh, in that facility visit, uh, apart from uh, helping the QI teams, uh, advancing in their 
quality improvement implementation knowledge. The team has contributed in, uh, uh, in other areas of the partnership, uh, including the lunch and learn uh, discussion in the ministry. We have this lunch and learn a practice that happens in the, in the lunch times of Thursday, and there is a policy discussion happening in the ministry. On that platform, the uh, Irish team has presented a good topic, and the uh, ministry side has gained a lot of things from that discussion. And the other uh, collaboration that we have worked in is the following the quality improvement uh, training. After having the QI teams of uh, 12 hospitals, uh, they have shown significant progress in uh, implementing the quality improvement projects. So the other project that we, have, we, are, we were having was the advanced training in quality and safety improvement. So to fill that gap, we discussed with the Irish team and they, uh, they sponsored the 25 uh, individuals, uh, the, 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 the guys who were involved in the, uh, the quality improvement training for the advanced uh, uh, education uh, uh, in the ESQA fellowship. So we are currently uh, in, the, in the final lines of uh, ESQA fellowship, and uh, we had 25 individuals uh, divided into three groups, studying as a, a team, uh, selecting a learning journey among the available uh, modules in the ESQA fellowship year one, and Due to COVID-19, we couldn't meet uh, the uh, other plans that we had uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, 2020. So we, we started to have the remote coaching for fellows, and uh, we had conducted uh, two fellowship uh, coaching sessions uh, with the team uh, giving the service in the, uh, the, in the Ireland, and the teams who are working in Jeta. Uh, collaboratively. So in this, in this platform, we have learned a lot, and we are also trying to implement the lessons that we have gained from this program. Uh, the first one is the uh, using of the virtual platform for improving quality improvement, uh, for the improving the quality of the service, and we have used for the national uh, initiatives, and now we are conducting the quality improvement training uh, online. Uh, for uh, the hospital teams uh, who are working in the uh, subnational uh, uh, platform the area. So, uh, uh, accordingly, we have also a good uh, discussion point in, the, in this collaboration that has give, given us uh, a good insight, the discussion on the accreditation uh, process. So, the ISQA has uh, helped us in exploring how to uh, work on accreditation process as a method of bringing about a quality improvement and sustaining that improvement uh, for long. So the national, uh, as a result of this discussion, we have started on working national uh, roadmap for healthcare accreditation. Uh, and these are my uh, reflections on our collaboration. I would like to thank the Irish Aid, uh, HSC, and specifically, uh, David has done a lot of great job in this process and uh, all other collaborating uh, partners. Thank you. Okay, th th thank you very much um, for your contribution uh, on quality improvement, um, which brings me uh, to uh, by no means least, but our last speaker, um, who is uh, Dr. Jonathan Satali. He is a registrar and CEO of the Zambian College of Medicine uh, and Surgery. He's an orthopedic surgeon and a trauma surgeon, and he is president of the Zambian Orthopedic and Trauma Association. And um, again, um, uh, Jonathan comes from Zambia, which uh, celebrates um, the link between the Equals Initiative, which is a HSE or CPI initiative uh, around medical equipment and Zambia. So, uh, Dr. Jonathan Satali, you're very welcome to the stage. Hello, I'm Jonathan, speaking to you on the subject Partnerships for Education and Training in a Changing World. So let us start by looking at what factors led to the creation of Zancoms. The critical shortage of human resources for health in developing countries 
is a well-documented fact. The case of Zambia is unfortunately not any different. As you can imagine, for an average Zambian, access to specialist care is difficult to say the least. To further compound the problem, the few specialists in the country are more or less all based in the capital Lusaka, meaning geographical barriers to accessing specialist care is a real bottleneck to addressing health inequalities. The last piece of the jigsaw is political will. In 2017, the Minister of Health and the government of the day took deliberate steps to address human resources for health. And through an MOU with the Zambia Medical Association and the Health Professions Council of Zambia, created the Zambia College of Medicine and Surgery, ZAC. Arising from the circumstances we were facing, ZACOMs forged local, regional, and international partnerships to ensure quality education. On the local front, we have partnered with the Ministry of Health and the local universities with health-related training programs. Our regional partnerships are with EXA colleges, and on the international front, we are working with the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland, the Equals Initiative, Jiao Tang University, the Merck Foundation, and the University of UK. Arising from COVID-19, our college has faced the following challenges. One, reduced funding. Because of this, we have had to look at our operational costs and make adjustments accordingly. Two, redirection of human resources towards the fight against COVID-19. Here, we've supported government on this move by redirecting only those whose academic interests are in tandem with the fight against COVID-19 in one way or the other. Three, reduced patient load. This has arisen because patients are shying away from our training facilities and most centers have scaled down their operations. So what we've done here is to engage our outreach services so that we keep our patient load up. <coughs> Four, no physical gatherings. This has especially affected our lectures, our meetings, uh, academic uh, uh, interaction really. What we've done here is we've moved our programs onto an online platform. Arising from this, all our programs now have a strong online component. Five, travel restrictions, especially affecting our foreign trainees, uh, trainers, and even examiners. Again, here, we've resorted to the online media to engage uh, our students using this uh, platform. And access also has been granted to various other uh, resources online. With all those partnerships, this is where we are today. As ZACOMS, we have uh, only a third year of our specialist training program. We have on board 279 uh, faculty, 410 students, and we're currently running 16 fellowships uh, across the whole country. This is remarkable, and it's a story that uh, could not have been possible without the various partnerships that we're discussing. Dr. Zitali, can you hear me? Okay, so we, we seem to have um, uh, lost contact with Dr. Zitali, but it was his very last slide. Um, and again, I'd like to thank all our, our speakers on this session for their contributions. It's uh, about partnerships and it's great to hear uh, the voice of our partners. So um, we have a, uh, some time for questions and answers. Um, so I'm going to um, ask some of the questions that have been posted online. And one of the questions I'd like to ask, and, and, and I'm conscious that um, there are several colleges present, Zacoms, uh, Cosexa, and Conexa, um, is that uh, all colleges seem to have um, pivoted um, to uh, education online and, and exams online. Uh, and yet uh, the WHO are telling us that um, internet connectivity is a huge issue. Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. So, so I'm kind of wondering, um, as colleges, have any of you had challenges in the delivery of either your curriculum or your exams 
due to uh, problems with access to the internet. And maybe uh, I'll start with uh, Doreen from Conexa. Doreen, you're on mute. Thank you, Brian. Yes, we do have um, um, Wi-Fi challenges, internet challenges, um, but we have made provision for our students to uh, to go to a site where there is reliable uh, Wi-Fi connectivity. Uh, but uh, because even during the exams, uh, a few of these students had challenges, but there was always a backup plan made by the country representatives. Okay, thank you very much. And again, uh, Stella from COSEXA, have there been any particular issues with the delivery in relation to connectivity? Yeah, thank you, Bren. Uh, just like uh, Doreen has said, uh, and if you remember, I mentioned that 90% of our examinations were, were successful, meaning the 10% was not, and that was based on internet. For example, in Zimbabwe, uh, some candidates were not able to do online, but we had a backup plan of paper-based examination, and those who had issues with internet did paper-based examination. Yes, we still have issues of technology, internet, and and so forth. Okay, th thank you very much. Um, and I, I, I guess the power of um, the internet and social media is exemplified, I, I guess, in, in um, uh, Joe Gallagher's piece around um, uh, the videos. And obviously, um, just in terms of that educational piece, I'm wondering what are the next steps in terms of the Gori Malawi partnership, given the fact uh, you've demonstrated it's, it's hugely successful in terms of the video penetration. I think it's a good question, Brian. I think one, one thing you've seen, as you said, is penetration. What we can't measure with that is the learning and did it change practice. So that's one of the challenges. The advantage of social media and using WhatsApp is it can probably penetrate farther. And interestingly, you know, Facebook, for instance, adjusts the video quality to the bandwidth that's been experienced. So there's a lot of use with that. The next steps, I think, would be to try and gather information on what are the best measures of, of whether that um, actually had any uh, impact. And maybe we may be able to incorporate, for instance, reactions on Facebook into that, and then using that Moodle platform to try and see, did people learn from it and create those communities of practice? That's a bit harder because it needs that, that bit more bandwidth. But one of the advantages of that platform is people can download it. So talking to our colleagues in Malawi, the idea being that even if you're in an area of poor bandwidth, you can be in the town or the city, download the lesson and then do it later and then upload your answers when you come back into the town or city later. So we may have to have some workarounds for, for a while until we get, get more, uh, more broadband, both in Ireland and Africa. Thank you very much for that. Um, just again, there was a comment from the um, questions and answers, just to clarify the, the Irish aid support for Conexo is 100k, 1,000 yeah, euros, not, not 1,000 euros. Um, the next question really is, is doc, for Dr. Uh, De Salem. Um, in, in terms of the quality improvement uh, piece, I'm very conscious, uh, and I've been involved with, with some quality improvement work in, in Ireland, that uh, COVID-19 has been a huge disruptor, uh, both in terms of gathering data and uh, you know, showing a quality improvement, uh, and it, it has um, stopped a lot of the QI projects that I'm familiar with, whereas resources have been sort of focusing on delivering COVID care. Has that been the case um, in Ethiopia? You're on, uh, you're on mute currently. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Please go ahead, yeah. Yes, Please. that was the challenge that we have. Uh... Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Please please go ahead, yeah. Well, this underlines the very point I was making at the very beginning of the session. Uh, Salem, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I, I, can, hear you. I can hear you, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did you hear my question? Yes, that was... Yes, that was the challenge that we, are, we have been facing through the initial phase of the uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, Unfortunately, your uh, connection is relatively poor. We're facing, and the, the public 
public health measures are uh, impacted, the quality improvement is severely impacted. Hello. Hello. Yeah, it's unfortunate. You're, you're intermittent. I can hear you intermittently. Do you want to try again? Okay. Uh, yes. The, the answer is yes. It has impacted our endeavor in improving the quality improvement. And the QI teams uh, couldn't perform uh, their, their role as, as, as it was uh, before the COVID was introduced in our country. Uh, and there were also the uh, factors from raising from the social uh, distancing and the public health measures, specifically patients who are not coming to the hospital so that the measurement part is severely affected. And there are also uh, the government decisions to switch some of the uh, facilities into uh, the COVID treatment center. And uh, that has impacted our uh, efforts in improving the quality improvement. But the other time, uh, after the uh, things are uh, settled uh, in the country, uh, it was reinitiated and uh, people are working on their quality improvement by this time and uh, the, uh, the regular uh, remote coaching uh, session has been uh, uh, restarted and we are currently running in a good way. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my next question is to, to Dr. Staley. Um, again, I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm, I'm just interested in terms of, um, from the college's perspective, um, uh, how has COVID-19 impacted on your ability to educate and train? Um, in terms of training, uh, save for... Is this for Dr. Dr. Sitali, Stella. It's Dr. Sitali. Oh, uh, okay. Black okay. Arms. I'll come back to you, if you can hear me. Dr. Sitali? Uh, hi, Brian. I can Thank hear you. you. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, we have been uh, impacted uh, quite negatively at uh, a couple of fronts. Um, like I tried to highlight in the, that presentation. Uh, firstly, uh, the biggest challenge has been uh, on the travel uh, restrictions that we've been faced. A lot of our training programs are scattered uh, right across the country. Uh, and we've been using this model where we're sending out train uh, trainers uh, from the center po points of training. Uh, to these uh, satellite training centers, but this couldn't uh, happen because of the COVID restrictions. Uh, we've, had, we, we've also not had um, uh, support from our trainers from overseas coming through. Uh, because of that, we've then moved on to using an online uh, platform. Um, again, uh, alive to the challenges that, uh, that has come with, uh, with uh, internet connectivity in, in, in various places. Mm -hmm. um, funding has also been uh, a, a big issue. Uh, as you can imagine, the resources of um, governments have all been moved towards uh, the fight for COVID-19. Uh, very little resources have been left uh, for uh, training uh, purposes. Uh, so again, you found that we've had to sort of adjust uh, our spending for this, uh, for this year uh, as a result of the COVID-19. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, that answer, should I say? So, so the next question is: I'm just uh, from the Open Forum. Um, is this, is this uh, towards um, Stella from Cosexa, um, and uh, it is about the harmonisation of medical council registration. So, is there any um, ambition or appetite for Cosexa to facilitate inter-country trainee rotations? Stella, you're on uh, mute. Uh, currently, we, we started with having the coordination of COSEXA programs in, in the region, uh, in specific countries, and uh, out of 14 COSEXA member countries, 12 recognize COSEXA certification, COSEXA programs and qualification, and the two that are still young COSEXA member states are in the process. When it comes to inter-recognition, I think it draws back to, to the national surgical uh, plans whereby for sex activities need to be embedded in the national programs for such harmonization of policies and programs to be effective. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the second piece was, uh, again, for yourself, um, Stella, is, is the idea of trying to make surgery more attractive to women. Yeah, yeah, actually, I've, I've seen... 
surgical trainees, uh, I suspect in Cosexa and in many countries are male. So mm -hmm. how, how do we um, attract more women into surgery? If you look at, um, first of all, the root of the problem, it's historical. Uh, in Africa, years back, we, people used to think uh, medical field is for men and these other professions are for female. But now Cosexa put a program, uh, Women in Surgery, and uh, as we speak, we are drawing our strategic plan uh, whereby we are providing programs of mentorship, leadership, and, uh, and role model forums where we, which are going to attract more female to Cosexa programs in surgery. Uh, do you have any sense um, uh, what percentage of women are engaged in the Cosexa training program? Yeah, currently, I, I will speak for maybe different specialties. For example, in plastic surgery, you find we have only six out of 23. But I could say out of 601, we have 140 female okay. training. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, our next question is for Doreen. So Doreen, you might just unmute your, your microphone there. And um, it, this question is, is, is one of the uh, delegates have asked, is Kenexa present in Nigeria or Ghana? No, those, those countries, Brian, are in West Africa and um, Kenexa is for East Central in Southern Africa. Yeah. So the answer is no. Thank you very much. And again, um, a question just from, from your presentation. I noted that um, in terms of um, one of the um, sort of pieces about COSEXA and CANEXA is that the regional recognition of the qualification and the regional recognition of the exam. And I think you mentioned that Tanzania doesn't recognize the exam currently. Is that, is that correct? Um, I've, I've just been corrected there. Uh, apparently I'd been misinformed. Uh, they've just recognized so it's now recognized in all the countries. Okay, that, that's, that's that, been corrected. Yes, that's good. And, and again, just to, on, a, on a personal level, just to, to say that uh, obviously, um, Connex has just delivered their first online exam ever. It was their first exam ever, and to do so during the time of COVID uh, speaks very highly of the organisation. So, so congratulations and, and well done for that. Um, my my sort of um, my last piece is really. Um, to just ask about, um, you know, uh, future plans uh, in terms of um, uh, where to from here. Um, uh, Doreen, as I'm speaking to you, what, what, is the, what are the future kind of, uh, in, in terms of the roadmap for the future for Connexa, what, what are the next big items that they'd like to achieve? They've written, they've done an exam delivery, so that, that's, uh, that's been a very positive ex development. Yes. Thanks, Brian. So the next step is to have a train for trainer course. Um, this is okay. being facilitated by the Royal College of Surgeons for Ireland. Um, and the assessments will be in December. And uh, we're also going to start enrollment for 2021. Uh, this is in January. And also the first half so the first quarter of uh, 2021, we hope to have the clinical examinations for our fellowship, because this could not be conducted as, um, as, as, as a result of COVID. Um, and the accreditation of the training institutions is going to be rolled on uh, in the beginning of 2021. So there's quite a lot of activity that's going to happen in the next year. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, again, I'm very conscious that um, there is a very close relationship between Conexa and Cosexa. So, so um, we, we can't have uh, um, uh, produced surgeons unless there are anesthesiologists to deliver uh, care for with them. So Stella, in terms of Cosexa, what would be the, the, the big challenges uh, over the next year? What are the big um, ambitions as an organization? Stella, you might unmute yourself. Uh, yes, Brian. Yep. You, you asked I, about I, the ambitions for the organization? The, the future. So, I mean, obviously COVID has been a huge challenge for every organization. So what, what, are, mm -hmm. the, what are the next um, 
you know, uh, in terms of the future for, for Cosexa, what are the, what direction is it going to go and what are the next uh, amb ambitions for Cosexa? It's obviously a well-developed organization. Where to from here? Uh, okay, thank you, Brian. I'll talk about the immediate plan for, in regards to COVID. Uh, we plan to have our FCS uh, examinations online and this will be a blended approach of examination whereby we'll have uh, external examiners online and then the national examiners at on site. So that's one way we are going to approach examination due to COVID. And um, in terms of the other activities, our strategic plan, we look at uh, having uh, around 1,000 to 1,200 more trainees. Uh, definitely we're going to put more, more input in, uh, in communication and um, uh, technology as well, and then visibility. We are also looking at uh, enhancing the, the sustainability in terms of finances uh, in our strategy to improve Cosexa's standing in, in terms of financial positioning. Uh, also, the training, the quality of training, we, we need to look at the program directors at country level, the country representatives and other incentives in addition to also sensitizing more women and having more programs to attract women to our programs. Uh, those are the key areas that we need to emphasize on and as well as working with the, uh, our complementary colleges, uh, Canexa, Exacon and Exaco. We all know that quality training of surgery is incomplete without the other professionals. So, those are the areas of our concentration going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stella. And, and perhaps my, my, my last uh, uh, question, if I could, would be back to um, Dr. Jonathan Satali from Zacoms. In, in terms of, um, uh, uh, Jonathan, you mentioned um, our partnership and the fact that there have been challenges in that space. Uh, in, in terms of Zacoms and the partnership, what would be their wish in terms of developing partnerships going forward? I think um, the biggest wish is to collaborate more uh, uh, from trainer to trainer, uh, mm -hmm. and then opportunities uh, for further uh, training uh, for the trainers uh, and opportunities uh, for student uh, rotations. Uh, we already have uh, in-country uh, student rotations, uh, but we think um, some value could be got if our students could even have uh, out-of-country experiences um, so those are sort of uh, areas we're looking at uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and the very, very last question is to Dr. Joe Gallagher. Um, and this is really about the video education series. Um, Joe, um, in relation to the success of this, it's obviously been successful. Is that going to change your approach to future projects? Yeah, I, I think so, Brian. It's... Um, it's, it's shown us that you can disseminate these widely and engender a lot of enthusiasm. So I, I can see, whereas before we would have focused very much on the workshops, these could very much be a prelude to that to in, in, you know, provide some education in advance and also encourage people to attend and, and certainly has moved us towards much more online education, even if COVID wasn't here in advance of any trips to our colleagues in Malawi. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. And, and again, I'd like to, on behalf of all, to thank our, our partners uh, who have been uh, very eloquent in, in actually expanding the value of partnership. And that really concludes the session two. Uh, so I'm gonna hand you back. I think we're gonna have a, a five minute break at this point in time for coffee. And session three begins at 11.40. That's in exactly six minutes. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>